Hello, everybody. This is a bit different from what you're used to seeing from me. I was contacted by another YouTuber named Patri uh, Patricia Taxon. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's a fictional. It's a fictional alien creature, <laughs> uh, a taxon. They're from Animorphs, so there, there's no official pronunciation. So... <laughs> Oh, I, I just was going for the username, but yeah, uh, I'm in the realm of something that sounds accurate to what I believe, how I believe the name should be pronounced, so yeah. Uh, they contacted me, asking if they wanted to talk about some some Pixar stuff, because, uh, as you may know, I've made a bit of, of a name for myself discussing my feelings on some of the more recent Pixar movies that have been released. I'm not entirely certain what all we're going to talk about today in totality, but I'm pretty much down to discuss whatever, because I can go for basically ever talking about Pixar related stuff. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I, I ate a shit ton of cereal and, I, and I'm caffeinated as well. I have some water with me. Oh, I do not. I probably should. Oh, well, too late. <laughs> I'll live. You'll live. I wanted to start on something that I know we both agree agree on. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so the call can begin amicably. Uh, I watched Lightyear. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It, it's next level bad. Yeah. So, like, I don't know, I don't know what I was expecting, but it, uh, like, <laughs> I, I guess my first question on that would be, cause I f what what are your main issues with Lightyear? Because I, I wonder if if our if we have the same criticisms of it. It's thematically completely incoherent. <laughs> I feel like 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 they wanted to, to do something about like workaholism. Uh, the thing with Buzz being so obsessed with completing the mission, doing doing what's right, finishing what he started, fixing what he messed up, that he forgets to live a full life with his best friend. But the follow through on this, they they fumble the bag. Uh, following through on this idea, because. <laughs> For one, it is a like a pretty selfless motivation to get the turnip off of the evil vine world. <laughs> Actually, I I don't I I don't I don't quite feel right morally condemning this guy and the methods they go through in order to like try and make like a point about workaholism is to have him simply be be tempted by a guy uh, the villain of the film who presents him a strictly evil version of the thing he was trying to do anyway which then becomes enmeshed like thematically enmeshed with with his desire to get the turnip off of the planet because they use the same fuel source i guess and they both kind of sound like they want to right wrongs in the past but <laughs> it's it, it, there's no relation like his job is done his job like he's he, we have a macguffin that definitely works it does it, it it is a functioning warp fuel core and all on all he needs to do is get get the warp fuel core into the into the turnip but we're still in this mode where his his him seeking out the warp fuel core is the reason that he missed out on a life with his, with his buddy so now his desire to get the warp fuel core into the turnip is also related to that for some reason uh, and i don't i don't understand it i don't understand how they're they're trying to fit things in that that don't that don't fit like it, it's incoherent it buzz has selfless motivations for about 80 percent of the entire movie and the only like moral complication is him being told just a, an explicitly evil version of the plan that just sounds kind of similar and uses the same fuel source yeah i i guess what might offer some insight on that is i listened to the director's commentary and one thing they said that was interesting was that they basically just wanted to make a, a fun Buzz Lightyear action movie, and then they would figure out the emotion later. So it may very well just be that they they tried to shoehorn in something meaningful that viewers could take away, and it just didn't. They didn't end up sticking the landing because they were their priorities lied elsewhere. Yeah, but it's also like not campy or schmaltzy enough to be like endearing they didn't make it a 90s throwback they didn't it looks like halo for babies it's <laughs> <laughs> which you you'd think that if, if there were ever a time to have a 90s throwback it would be a movie that wants you to think took place or was released in 1995 yeah, and the other thing that really, really annoyed me and that made me think, like, this is just they're they're pulling this shit together from like basic parts that they that they think are supposed to go in a in a kids movie, like because kids movies always have the thing that shows up at the beginning and then turns out to be unexpectedly useful later. So they employ the fucking pen. As <laughs> pen. Um, <laughs> I I had to think about why I hate 
the the stupid pen so much and it's because the thing with setup payoff and reminder is that when it works like all three of those parts disguise the nature of their own role in the narrative uh in, in a movie i know you like uh cloudy with a chance of meatballs yeah i was the, gonna and the reason that the the spray on shoes payoff works in cloudy with a chance is because the reminder is itself like a joke it's funny that you see him as an adult and he still has the shoes on it's something that would work even if even divorced from the the final payoff of him using it to to uh decommission the the robot it's actually like it's thrilling when this thing that's been like a joke <laughs> a running gag for the entire thing like suddenly becomes the catalyst to save the day it's it's thrilling and, and satisfying in a very simple way the stupid pen is is it's just there the guy keeps just keeps on calling attention to it like does anyone need a pen <laughs> like like he knows that, that he has to remind everyone that the pen exists the second i saw it i'm like oh so that's we're just waiting for the moment where that saves the day great that's fantastic I and love... the way that it saves the day is <laughs> so like in like unsubstantial the, the the air filter or sorry the air brake gets stuck so they need to jam it open yeah, it feels cobbled together from, like, things that they think a kid's movie should have. It's really got legitimate first draft energy. It's <laughs> It does feel very by the books or paint by numbers in terms of what it tries to achieve. It doesn't... <sighs> Light paint, years. By, paint by numbers and not really understanding the tropes that it's employing, even. like. <laughs> yeah, then you have just... So, here's a question. What was your reaction when Zerg reveals himself for the person who he really is i um ac i don't mind that they that they retconned the the thing from toy story 2 because like i i was kind of dreading that they were just going to do a star wars i thought that would have been like kind of boring and i like that they called attention to it having him say like oh dad they're saying like yes we hear you we're <laughs> we're retconning this i hate the twist Time travel in stories is a terrible idea most of the time. It's a terrible idea, but here it's like especially bad because they like they play so fast and loose as to whether they're using Harry Potter rules or Back to the Future rules or Terminator rules. Like, what does Evil Buzz think is going to happen when they stop the accident from happening? Like, are <laughs> so when I was in the theater. I was ready to say, like, I, I, because this is the first time I ever saw a Pixar movie. I went in with a notebook ready to take notes for a review because I, I, at that point, had found an audience for talking about Pixar stuff. And when we got to that scene, I was writing down, I was ready to write down, yep, it's his father. And I was going to criticize that for just being, like, trying to paint this obvious joke from Toy Story 2 as a really serious moment. But then... I, I looked up at the... I think that you can even see on the notebook where my pen scribbles a little bit because my brain is trying to process the stupidity that was just blasted into my ears. And then you think about all the logistics of how it works because some, something that some people told me in my comments was, well, it could make sense if it's supposed to be a thing where it's like Endgame where it's an alternate timeline of events so he's not actually going to create a time paradox. But if that's the case, then you're not actually going to change anything when you go back in time. You're just yes. you and also the buzz that we follow would be evil buzz. Like we like the buzz that we're following in the movie is the one that already arrives in the altered timeline. So it's not Terminator rules. It's stupid. And <laughs> even cuz we can speculate on whether what type of time travel rules they're going for, but the fact that we even have to speculate means maybe we just shouldn't risk it at all cuz we don't know what's going to happen when we go back in time and r radically alter the course of history. Either nothing, either nothing changes to the people that you're trying to save, or the universe self implodes. So yeah. I feel like nobody wins here, no matter what we do. Time time travel is, it's got teeth. It, it's if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it right. If if you're gonna do it, you, you gotta you gotta make the whole movie about it. Like you gotta really delve into it, like like a primer or a. a a predestination because time not spent explaining what evil buzz thinks is gonna happen if he rewrites history is just frustrating empty space it's it's uh i, I don't that what it honestly feels like to me is it felt like they knew that they were gonna that the general reaction was gonna be yep it's just his father duh, duh, duh. so they thought what's the craziest thing we can possibly do to get people to go what i didn't think that was gonna happen and in the process they just didn't think about how it was going imp to imp implicate the story as a whole. Yeah, 
because it's it's kind of a break from the form of the movie because the the movie is so relatively grounded having the him going going into the future via time dilation and not uh magic yeah i was i was really happy to see that it's not exactly correct but it at least when i saw that in the trailer i at least thought okay so they care about making sure it feels like this could actually scientifically happen and then we got to that scene, and I'm just like, oh, so you just threw in the towel. You you stopped caring. Yeah. We have both, like, grounded, halfway scientifically accurate time travel, and then uh, on the 11th hour, we, we then also have magic time travel. <laughs> I, I don't. It's... And the line in the middle of the movie where Buzz mutters, I think I need a time machine to get out of this mess. When I heard that, I was like, that's a weird... Oh, does he say that? Yeah, he does. When when they when Zerg shoots them out of the air and they crash land in that blue wasteland next to the facility, they need to get the little crystal fusion thing. They need to fix whatever whatever MacGuffin they're hunting for that leads to the cylindrical cone uh, room thing. When they crash land there, Buzz is, leans up against the ship and he says, I, I, mean, "I need a time machine to get out of this mess." And it's <laughs> when I heard it, I just was like, "Why did you say that?" And then in retrospect, it's just, "Oh, what were you?" That there's a, there's that, a lot of that. I hated every every line that was a callback to um, dialogue from the original Toy Story. Oh, <laughs> I I hated that they even got him to say my ship. <laughs> yep, there's so, there's so many of those little things that just like you don't please stop. It, and, it, and one of them one of them really like bugged me when he arrives after the big jump in time after the the successful uh, warp trip. The, the 2001 A Space Odyssey warp trip. He calls in to Star Command, and he gets no response, and he says, why don't they answer? It's like, hmm. That, that, one, that one really bugged me, because the reason he says that in, in Toy Story is because he's presumably been trying to call Star Command this entire time, and they don't answer because he, he's just speaking into his plastic arm. But this is exactly one... This this is his first attempt to... <laughs> yeah, he's, he's never used that risk communicator, because previously it was always him doing the mission log. Now it's him actually trying to talk to him, and the first time he tries to do it, they're like, it's... Suddenly it's as if this is always a, a constant thing you're trying to do that fails. Yeah, uh, so he would say... Why aren't they answering? It, w- it wouldn't be why don't they answer. I also like that of all times to ask that question. This seems like a pretty good time for where you might have a decent understanding as to why they're not answering you, given what you what the what the last thing you did in their lives was, which was steal their ship and leave for twenty yeah. years or whatever. That's it. Wastes a lot of time. The prologue feels like it's like like they're doing a first ten minutes of up thing, but it's. Oh. It, Absolutely, but, but it takes up so much time, and we don't get that much information because because Buzz isn't experiencing any of it. Yeah, that's my biggest criticism of Alicia's character, not even her character, but the way the movie presents it is that they 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 so desperately want to go for that emotional hook of look at this character and how great everything is, and then they rip your heart out. But all of that that the the prime focus of the beginning of the movie is Buzz's space adventures, while Michael Giacchino's. It's alarmingly upbeat music plays in the background of that, and you're just kind of seeing her life happen in the background, but then suddenly it, it puts her as the center of attention and makes tries to rip the emotion out, but she... They, they have a joke about her getting worse at driving? Uh, yeah, I... That's... <laughs> ah, it's so weird. Of all the things to focus on, that's the... I don't... I don't... I don't get... I don't... I don't know what they were... Because they, they've said in the commentary that Alicia is the emotional core of the film, and, like, that's the thing that saved the film. But if that's the case, then why why wasn't she... Why wasn't the emphasis of that opening montage on her life passing by? Why was it concentrated so heavily on uh, Buzz screwing up and then pulling some straight-up bullshit out of his ass to save himself in outer space? Yeah, the, it's... The... <laughs> The the contrivance that they set up for it not working for that entire time is that it just took the cat, the, the cat th- that lo- I hate the cat. I hate the cat exactly as much as you do. I hate oh my his, god! I hate his stupid fucking face. This, <laughs> <laughs> I, this this two people on the planet that hate socks. I found them. I found another person <laughs> that doesn't fawn over the stupid cat. Stupid cat. I am I am the type. I am weak to like cute animal shit. You might have noticed, but. I I wanted to punt that stupid animal. <laughs> I 
Do you like how he just is a one-stop shop for every every mystery mouse tool they need to do everything, including yeah. a flamethrower? I feel like like if if they if they ran with that like as a joke, it might have been funny, but it's it just happens so infrequently that I it, it's not that often actually that he just pulls something out of the cat to save the day. What? Okay, I'm sorry. I just remembered the entire climax of the movie. What are the are the comedic relief side characters actually supposed to be doing that entire time? Like, what their mission was to seal off exactly one hallway? I I, I don't understand what it's that whole side the whole that exists just to pay off Darby's. I can take any three objects and make them explode, which is the dumb one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. It's like, all right, here's three Lego pieces. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> she makes she makes a bomb out of bubble gum, the wrapper, and the teleporter. I, I don't don't ask me how. Don't ask me how how she pulled that off. But I guess she. Oh, and also to pay off the surrender string on on the suits, I guess. But as to what they're actually doing there, yeah, they're just supposed to to close the door to guard to prevent the the Zerg robots from getting to the ship down a single point of entry and nowhere else. It's a very geometrically confusing climax. They're, they're trying to make a cartoon action movie, but the action is incomprehensible. Oh yeah, did you love when the, when the self-destruct sequence went off and they didn't explode inside the ship? It, 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 they, they, it waited until they got outside the ship despite the countdown having already been concluded. Then it exploded, and then Buzz is like cartwheeling through the air at very dangerous speeds, slams into the ship, nothing happens to him. But that's not even the worst part, because then, miraculously, Zerg survived the explosion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's really tough. <laughs> and then he survives another one! Did you watch the post credit scene? Yeah, it- it- it's... He, su he survives a second explo- I- I- <sighs> Did you like the part where they're getting chased by a ship, and they crash land in the middle of a- of a massive clearing, and the- the ship just forgets about them? Yep, I- I- that was my favorite part. I also like that Zerg needs them alive, and he's trying to- kill them despite the fact that he knows that there's a very volatile fuel source on board that ship seems like some counterintuitive reasoning there to try to shoot it but it's fine and yeah they just they, he shoots it they crash and then he just disappears he just flies off like, okay see you later then i guess <laughs> guess you don't want to follow up on that that's cool i it's love this movie a, it's, it's such a it's a confusing movie um I am making another video on it and i'm gonna have a bla i'm gonna have a blast ripping it apart because yeah so, it's it, it's Honestly, the worst, like, when I first went to go see it, I thought the worst it would be was, like, well, that was nothing. But it's just so, so outrageously dumb in so many aspects. What am I supposed to feel during that first action scene where, where Buzz has just met his new comrades and they're fighting exactly one robot? Because the whole thing is, like, funny and no one cares. <laughs> The guys, the goons, are just doing target practice. And then they accidentally save him by firing the harpoon and the... Th th he misses the target because he hits the teleporter instead. And then one harpoon is enough to knock out that robot long enough for them to leave. But then he wakes up. What What was the point of them having that robot appear over and over again? Like, it kept following them throughout the movie, only for it to get sp squished by the, the, the ship in, in, in the lava geyser area. And then it reappeared after they destroyed the Zerg ship. When they just established earlier that if you destroy the Zerg ship, it will take all the robots offline. It's such yeah, it's, it's so weird. It's it's the kind of thing where I want to get on board, but it's I'm being prevented because the actions happening on screen are like very immediately confusing. <laughs> like not 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 even like you have to think about it too much. The the general consensus on this movie seems to be that it's not that great. Like it seems that general audiences have have arrived at consensus that yeah, this is one of Pixar's significantly weaker films just because i don't know it's just the same it doesn't feel like it visually it, it has the same technical prowess as a standard pixar movie that would release nowadays i don't know if this is a great way to describe it but it feels like it's trying to be a pixar film in that you have the big emotional set piece and you have a lot of the the, the traits that seem reminiscent of something that they would make but it just it's missing all the core it's missing the things that would link those emotional payoffs together into a cohesive whole. It's missing the like the vital organs. It's missing they like they forgot to have the movie actually be about workaholism or putting work ahead of your life and your friends. Evil Buzz wants to to rid himself of sin. It's it's this 
it's this kind of the like conflicting views on redemption almost but it's there, there's just not enough there's not enough meat there's not there's and and what's there is contradictory and and confusing and incoherent <laughs> yeah i don't i don't even know it's unfortunate that light that my light your video is probably my most poorly received just for all the wrong reasons <laughs> I feel like you could have gone a little harder on it, but I, but now it's like you can because it's it's avail it's available to be scrubbed through. Yeah, now that I have the video in full, I or the movie in full, I can I can go frame by frame and and give it the proper dissection. Yeah, that I, it, I wish I could have given the first time. It's a movie that really deserves uh the gaming magic treatment, honestly. <laughs> Like you, you talk a lot about uh, like in the Toy Story Four video, you say like they cheated, they 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 edited it to make it look like a cohesive moment. But if you think about it, they they cheat. They don't even cheat in in Lightyear. It just doesn't make sense on a on a direct level. Yeah, it's it's, it's on surface level. You can look at it and be like, so he they Zerg exploded, right? How did he? Shouldn't okay. I you don't. There is some commendation, I think, to be given to a successful cheat. If if good editing can sell the motion of a scene, even if the, the moving parts don't fit together, I think that is worth pointing out. But we, we don't even have that. We don't. And I guess that would be one point of uh, contention we might have. I don't typically like it when films cheat like that anyway, because that, that's one thing that can rip me right out of a movie, is if they present events to me in one way, and then they change pretty quickly afterwards. Now, I acknowledge that for many people, they won't notice that, or even if they do, they won't particularly care, but that's that's one thing for me that I really don't like when it happens. Uh, for instance, in Toy Story 3, which, if you don't know, is my favorite movie of all time, there's a scene on the playground where the Woody, Bullseye, and the little green aliens are slinking by the big baby on the swing set. It shows them behind the mulch box or whatever, and then it cuts to the next shot, and they're underneath a bucket that they could not have possibly gotten to without Big Baby seeing them. That's, I really do not like the part of that part of the movie because it just, it rips me right out of it. And like, you, you weren't, you couldn't, that's not, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a big thing for me is that I, I value, I value being able to follow along because any, any little break like that can rip me right out of the experience. Yeah, I, I understand that. I think like some some movies are better at getting away with it than others. And I, I think that like there is a craft to, to successfully cheating like that. Like, like maintaining a, a kind of direct visual cohesion, uh, e even if the logic doesn't really hold up. My, <laughs> I, I watch a lot of art house movies. I am a bit of a, like a bitch of snob uh, when it, when it comes to, 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 to things like this. I, I feel like a, a strictly cohesive, well-maintained script is not really enough for me to, to, to latch on to something. Well, uh, I guess what I can say about that is, like, let's take a hypothetical story. It's, um, Steve woke up. Steve ran out of eggs. Steve went to the store to buy eggs to the end. Well, that's a pretty cohesive story, but also, like, why did you even bother? Because there's nothing else there. Yeah. So, I, I would agree that a, co like, a completely cohesive story does not in and of itself warrant, well, I, I guess I would say it warrants praise in terms of that they made sure to take the effort to keep it consistent, but if that's all you have, then it's not going to be enough for me. To further that, I guess, for Toy Story 4, let's jump over to the a hypothetical alternate timeline where everything I brought up in terms of camera cheating and little inconsistencies and in geography and things like that, none of that exists. It all runs totally logically, and they 10, 10 out of 10 in terms of plot consistency. That wouldn't really make me hate the movie any less significantly because the thing that really, really pisses me off about it is how the characters are treated. That's that's what I value most in terms yeah, of the they, story. Is they flanderized the your kins? Like they... yeah, I I guess I can ask about that. How do you feel about the characters of Toy Story Four? Okay, I agree on some level. I think they're really stretching, trying to figure out like something for Buzz to do because the most interesting thing about him is the existential crisis that he has in movie one. I, I, I don't really, I'm not compelled by simply a competent, kind-hearted, altruistic uh, dude. And that's why a lot of like his, his plots in Toy Story 2 and 3 involve him being compromised somewhat by like meeting Toy Story 2 kind of relegates him to a, a, a more action-centric B-plot and Toy Story 3, like, actually invents reasons to to revert him back to his previous personality and then do other gags with him, like the Spanish buzz. So Toy Story 4 uh, employs what is definitely the clumsiest attempt at keeping this character relevant 
to the story. But here, my my hot take is, I actually think like like Toy Story three is the the odd one out. I think Toy Story three kind of of messed things up, and Toy Story four is merely doing a mediocre job of picking up the pieces. I I, I think Toy Story two is is like the last really good one. <laughs> Well, I am certainly open to hearing your perspective on that. So, the villain in Toy Story 2 is not merely a uh, antagonist. He he actually is a foil. The the prospector, my my probably my favorite villain in Pixar movies. His uh his issue is that he forgoes the beautiful now in service of staving off oblivion. He is he cannot accept the simultaneous reality that we will be left behind in a landfill one day, but also we're alive now and loved and it's beautiful. He he's he must uh stave off oblivion by being this preserved collector's item in a museum. And that is why I think it is unsatisfying when we skip to Toy Story 3 and the conclusion is simply that Woody gets another kid. I think, I, I actually think the only satisfying conclusion is is uh, for Woody to defect from <laughs> from from the gang. I, I think the entire message of, of the second movie was was that that can't last forever, that he's he's alive now and loved, which is beautiful and precious and, and can't be missed, but also he will die. He will be a- abandoned. He, he will be a sentient pile of ash in a landfill eventually. And I think like Toy Story 3 does a big job of looking like it's falling, like following through on these things. Like it has the most... Like when I saw it uh, when I was 11, it was the most epic possible thing that that ship with the incinerator. But it's 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 honestly like it's like like a much more childish take on the th- on the themes of 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 Toy Story 2. Um, like they have th- the reason that the prospector's karmic pun- punishment is to end up with a with an owner that decorates and modifies her toys is not just because that's like a bad outcome for him, but it's it directly challenges his status as a uh, perfectly preserved collector's item that he will now be forced to uh, experience the the beautiful and impermanent now and confront his own impermanence. Whereas I don't understand like the thematic significance of Lotso being taped to the front of a truck it's 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 just like weird and mean and uncomfortable like existentially uh threatening well i guess just on the Lotso front given that he was sort of a tyrannical dictator for lack of a better term in terms of essentially condemning toys to torture because that's basically what the rough play scene is for a toy that's their form of torture is being played with and having being shoved inside children's mouths, 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 and up their noses, and just the the awful means he used to essentially create this this impenetrable prison where everyone succumbs to his will or else, and literally condemns the toys to a fiery inferno even after they risk themselves to save his life. I feel like it's it's war- it warrants a bit of a mean outcome for him, and I can tell you the reason why they chose to put him on the front of the truck just as a nod to the the fact that apparently a lot of garbage truck drivers will do that if they find a if they find a toy lying around they'll they'll tape it to the front of their truck to give it a second chance i suppose but i find it interesting that were you i don't want to put words in your mouth were you meant to imply that the incinerator scene is childish because you kind of said that in tandem of talking about how toy story 3 is it i it suggests the idea of a like a more mature epic conclusion, but I think there is nothing that elicits that complex, queasy feeling that you get when the prospector very coldly insinuates that that the choice is to be a collector's item or to just eventually end up in a landfill. I find the ending to Toy Story Three to be kind of like syrupy and. Like we find out that it's it wasn't a choice between uh, accepting the beautiful now and oblivion at the same time versus staving off ob- oblivion. We're actually simply pre- uh, presented with a new contradictory forever that that uh, Woody can continue to be a, a torch passed down for generations. I, I I find that to be like a very like unsatisfying band aid uh, solution to the to the themes presented in Toy Story two. Not to say that like that 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 Toy Story four is that much more coherent. I think Toy Story three should have had something similar to Toy Story four's ending. Like 
Andy is is getting sick of them. The jig is up. They're and and now they are they they must face ob- oblivion. They they must face death. I I do not buy. I don't buy the metaphor that the toys are supposed to be parents, or at least not exclusively. It is it occasionally works with that framing, but uh, like all good metaphors, it is squishy and all, and a little bit uh broad. Because if it were if you wanted it to be about something specific, you would have just had them be parents. Um. I think there is also a sort of human versus God relationship that the toys have with their kids, that perhaps the kid represents a, a sort of temporary heaven or a place of worship that, that, they, that, that they then must abandon as they face oblivion. So I, <laughs> I, I think like the one thing that I will defend about Toy Story 4 is the decision to have Woody leave the group at the end. I, I think it is confused that he does that while Bonnie is still a toddler. I... I would have had another time skip. I would have had Bonnie also grow up. <laughs> and maybe then Woody realizes that that perhaps this can't just keep happening. You can't keep keep acting like he will be coincidentally granted new gods to worship and he like that his only life is now um weathering uh his own mortality. Well, I guess to kind of wrap up the Toy Story 3 before we move on to talking about 4, I I will defend to the death that the incinerator scene is one of the most powerful things Pixar has ever created. The the fact that they're placed in this because it conceptually that little bowl of a of an arena that they're trapped in is conceived to be this impossible room they can't escape from. Because you usually have a sense that's the first time ever that I had a sense of what can happen now. Because usually when you watch a movie, even if things seem unwinnable, you kind of have the thing at the back of your head that tells you, well, I mean, it's a kids movie, so what are they gonna really do? But when you're in this arena where there's no, conceivably there's no way they could escape, it's just, it was the most heart-sinking thing that I've ever experienced. They're, they're sitting there literally staring death, a horrifically painful death, right in the face, and it's such a meaningful moment that they, it's, it's kind of like they're, you're in a plane going down. Like, are you just going to start? I, re- I think it would have been meaningful if they actually got incinerated. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's meaningful anyway, because it's just... It's the idea that these toys have chosen to accept their fate with dignity rather than flailing around erratically screaming. They've, they, they, don't, they choose not to die struggling, but to remain calm and just hold hands together there as a family. And even just all the little things that, of all the toys, Woody is the last one to give up. He, he's still going. Even after everyone else throws in the towel, he's the last one to give up. It also ties in nicely with, obviously, the setup at the end of Toy Story 2 of the aliens being eternally grateful and owing their lives essentially to the potato heads because it's not even that they think they're doing anything particularly heroic there they're just kind of repaying their debt to mr potato head but but that that only makes it all the more disappointing when the the conclusion is that they get another kid that they that they then do not like no longer have to face death or the possibility of having an end that, that thematically speaking, that would be the end of a toy's life. There's nothing beyond screaming towards the belching inferno of an incinerator. That's about as far as a toy's life can possibly get. So they've, for lack of a better term, been to hell and back, and they're pretty much ready to accept whatever fate Andy has for them. It's only through Woody's last decision that they actually get that chance to go with Bonnie at the end. And I guess in terms of just talking about the ending, I, I would just defend it as the optimist again that it is that there is this alternative where they can keep getting they, they can keep being passed down and, and granting new memories for for kids as, as they go throughout their lives it's to me that is just a little bit too similar to what what the prospector was tempting woody with that with the idea that that they would be adored on a museum stand that well I, I can see how you can reach, reach that conclusion, but what I would cite as the difference there is that when you're in a museum, you're just an idle figure. Like, kids are just going to gawk at you, and you aren't really... You're loved only in the most superficial of ways, in that it's a bunch of customers strolling through an exhibit or whatever they were actually going to be in that place. Whereas with Bonnie, Woody saw clearly in his first little playtime how much of a difference the toys actually made in her lives. So I don't think it's a direct parallel in terms of being a museum exhibit versus actively working to create lifelong memories for a new child. The ending of Toy Story 2 felt more decisive than that. Woody saying that Andy is going to to grow up, but that he wouldn't miss it for the world, that we are going to die, but also we're alive now. I like that more. I like I like there being 
a a fatalistic optimism to the to the story that there is an end approaching that we that we all know of but that life is is worth living anyways that that feels like like the the core of of toy story 2 and at the end of toy story 3 they're essentially granted immortality which which feels like a cop out i that, that's 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 just my my take i uh, i think you could end it on uh, toy story 2 i guess you i would say you could end it at really any of the first three and you'd get somewhat of a conclusive ending but i think that toy story 3 is just uh traveling to that final that ultimate destination that toy story 2 set up because obviously prospector talks about how posing the question of whether Randy's going to bring woody to college and then toy story 3 develops that by actually setting them at the end setting the toys at the end of what would hypothetically be their lifespan and then exploring what would ultimately become of them and i don't think it really takes away from from anything the movies were trying to establish by giving them that that final happy ending with give because that's what toys are meant to do they're meant to create happy memories and be there for for a support for the kid whenever they need to be so i think to relegate them to either an attic or being alongside andy would be a bit a bit less meaningful as a destination for them But of course, I don't want to like pin you here or anything. We we're, we can move on to Toy Story four whenever you want. Uh, well, I was I was sort of talking about both movies in tandem with each other. I think four. I, I agree with you. I think it does contradict the ending of three, but I think it was a worthy sacrifice to make. I I I think it's a better follow up to two than it was to three. That doesn't mean it's good. Uh, <laughs> I I'm like fiercely lukewarm on it. I I really just I feel very strongly that that's just not something Woody would ever do, especially. Especially when the film goes to show that the only reason why it even happens is because Woody went out of his way to make sure Bonnie was taken care of at kindergarten. It feels irresponsible of him to uh, to abandon her. I just, I, I really don't feel like that's something Woody would have ever done. Yeah, he wouldn't have done it in this movie. I, I think he would have at the end of, of Toy Story 3. I think that movie feels like it wants to communicate that the jig is up, that they're, like, that, that they can't be immortal, that Andy is, is grown up now. And I feel like Toy Story 4 should have had another time skip, where now Bonnie, too, is outgrowing them. In this one, it definitely wouldn't have, which is my... Because my my experience watching this movie was that for... It was sort of a gradual decline in terms of my investment in it, where the more things that kept happening... The first major break was when Buzz started pushing the buttons on his chest. It was like, what? What are we doing here? And then it just kept getting worse and worse. But the definitive point where I just checked out was the very end, where... What he actually leaves, I, I legitimately could not believe that was actually happening because it just ran so contrary to who they had set up Woody to be prior to that point. Just, just because the, the idea that Woody isn't played with for a certain number of time, and then decides that, well, I guess she doesn't need me anymore after everything that had been that they had worked to set up throughout the original trilogy, just felt so inconsistent with his character. That makes sense. I, I feel like it was like they were more so half remembering two than they were remembering three. Like they, they were I would argue that two might be the one that that stands in in stark contrast to four the most, because Toy Story Two is the one that offers Woody that that possibility of going to the museum and living uh, eternally while escaping the inevitability of his fate at the hands of Andy. But what he ultimately concludes is, well, whatever Andy has in store for me I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me because I'm going to be here around, I'm going to be here to the end, or to infinity and beyond, rather. God has no a plan what. for him. But then in Toy Story 4, it presents him that same type of thing where, hey, you can go explore the world with Bo Peep, but then it actually makes him do it this time. It just feels, it, it kind of feels like it took all the lessons that Woody learned throughout 1, 2, and 3 and just reversed them for the sake of, because... Something that I learned is that they weren't originally they they didn't they even they weren't sure if they were going to commit to this ending because they were like do we really want to do this but then apparently what made them what convinced them to go for it was that they brought Tim Allen into the studio and he was emotional at the ending and then that's what made them go all right let's do it so what it feels like happened to me is they they because the general consensus regardless of whether you like it or not seems to be by most people that toy Story 3 was the perfect ending of the trilogy and they shouldn't have done anything after that would you agree with that general sentiment from the public yeah at large yeah i remember and because of that pixar it seems like they were very self-aware because in, in a lot of interviews the first thing they'll say was 
well, I mean, everyone told us that Toy Story 3 was the perfect ending, so we didn't want to screw it up, we knew we didn't want to ruin people's childhood, and it did, we didn't want to make it feel like just another fourth entry, or just another entry in a series, so... What it feels like, what feels like happened to me is that they were aware of that, and they decided that, well, if we're gonna justify our existence as a fourth Toy Story movie, we gotta do something to try to generate that same emotional, re that visceral emotional reaction that so many people had watching Toy Story 3, and that kind of feels like why they set up Woody to make the choice that, it do that he does, especially because the rest of the movie doesn't really work to support it with what the, the lessons he's imparting to others and the things he, the practices he's preaching about and it just it, it feels very tacked on in the end and i think that might serve as a motivation for why it feels that way um all right i i have a hard question uh do you actually think that the directors were intentionally sabotaging the franchise or was that just a bit well, so, I don't know if you heard in part five, but those were real tears that were coming out. Yeah, when you, I was you sounded, the like, th that sounded like real emotion. Yeah, I, I really, I, I have a visceral hatred for Toy Story 4. But as far as Josh Cooley himself, I don't believe that the movie was made out of incompetence and that he just fumbled over the bag. I, I don't think that was the case. Uh, because I've seen his other work, I've seen things he's worked on, things he's written, and things he's made, and I know that he's not some random incompetent director that was given Toy Story and just didn't know what the hell he was doing. I, I commit pretty hard to the idea that he maliciously went out of his way to destroy the characters of, of Toy Story. It's either that he wanted to change what happened in Toy Story 3 to give it a different ending, which I think would fit the bill of he didn't like how Toy Story 3 ended and tried to go out of his way to reverse, basically reverse it entirely, which I would probably fall into the category of maybe Malice is a bit of a stretch, but it definitely is out of contempt for Toy Story 3. But I, I don't think he's a terrible person, If to, to clarify that. That's, I, I, w I wish no ill intent or harm upon him whatsoever. I'm, and I'm sure if, if in some random act of fate he ever wanted to actually talk to me, I would not want to bite his head off. I'm sure it would be a pleasant conversation. I think there is a bit of, um, I, I think I can imagine that the writer of, to writer of Toy Story 4 was maybe had similar feelings as I did for the ending of Toy Story 3. Yeah, that's kind of the feeling I get as well, and that's, that's why I committed so hardcore to the idea that he worked so hard to undo Toy Story 3's ending, because it just really feels like that's what was going on with that final scene. Um, I want to, I want to come to you with, like, I, I under, like, a story that I think might might uh, foster a bit more uh, relatability between us because I I recognize that like heart anger at your your kins being messed up. This this is a very like different mo movie. A while back I watched this movie called The Gift from 2015, and I watched it because the director cited my favorite fucking movie as like an inspiration. Like it's a it's not a, like a remake, but he's openly like taking inspiration from it, lifting scenes from it. It's not like plagiarism, but it's uh very directly inspired inspired it is my favorite movie is Caché directed by Mikhail Haneke it's this incredibly like gripping uh thriller uh the the, the hook is is that a, a family living in in urban France keep getting mailed uh tapes of their house from seemingly impossible angles where they would have seen a camera uh and it, and it it sort of builds from that it's a it's tense it's political uh surprisingly there is a very precise political angle to the film there are moments in it that feel like like jump scares even if even if there's no like loud noise accompanying them there's like emotional jump scares in this movie it is directed with a, a seemingly like endless meticulous appreciation for simply the beauty of shapes filling a frame like the uh, urban france look it, it, it is just such an achingly beautiful movie even though it is filming like some pretty drab normal like urban landscapes the characters are so like interesting and entangled and they all have like their own subtle arcs outside of what we're directly seeing and the gift seemed to just not see any of that it was it sucked it, it was like irredeemably bad it, to the point where like I was personally offended that this is what this director saw in it like this <laughs> like he took this incredible um beautiful heart-wrenching like political thriller and turned it into a scary movie where a guy is creepy and and the the, the final twist of the ending is just unforgivable I won't spoil it in case some of you care about the gift 2015 but it is such a transparent attempt to one-up the source material in terms of like shock value 
uh which is you might notice is another thing that like like when spike lee remade old boy and, and tried to like one up the twist at the end and have it e like be even more like disturbing but in the process erased a lot of the of the villain's um depth and intrigue i i i felt that heart anger that like the the tears the the tears being felt personally slighted by this movie and like i want to i want to say very calmly i think this heart anger comes from like anthropomorphizing the movie into a person like like the into a being that can betray me and violate my consent like i'm not angry at the director i'm like angry at the film itself but like i have to step back and realize that the movie is not a person it is it is a, a piece of art that i engaged with willingly and, and like sort of step away from like what i think is a, is kind of unproductive like like feel as as if i was personally slighted by a movie being bad and i, and I want to appeal to you on that front that i that i understand the like the burning like heart anger because I, I i also feel like very intense attachments to fictional characters and stories and and ideas and art that i can accidentally like anthropomorphize the art and sort of be be, be overcome with an existential terror that the art is not the person that i want it to be did any of that make sense yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. I, I guess the only thing I have to say in response to that is it's it's not so much the movie itself because, as I said before, if if, if all Toy Story Four was was just this mangled mess of random, kind of like Lightyear, a mangled mess of thematically vacant, outrageously stupid scenes, it would it, I'd kind of be like, well, that was dumb. That was a waste of money. Moving along with my life, then the the only part the 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 only thing that will really get that level of vitriolic hatred out of me is if you mess with the integrity of the characters, because the characters, while they are entirely fictional... I actually wrote a, uh, a speech about this in high school. The, the characters are fictional. They're not real. They're just drawings, pixels, whatever they may, they may be. They aren't real. They can't interact with you. Any relationship you have, or any, any attachment you feel to a fictional character is entirely parasocial, and it's one-sided, and it's, it's, with, it's with an entity that is not real. But you still, for whatever reason, that is down to the individual person, for what, what about a character makes you connect with them, makes you feel for them, makes you relate to their journey, you have a certain understanding in your head of the reasons why you relate to the characters that you do and when that is contradicted it kind of stings because that it's like this this character that you uh either idolized or built up in your head or connected to or even was just even was just there for you because one thing i've said in uh previous live streams is that i had a uh, very life-threatening surgery when i was very very young and the one thing that was kind of there was a source of reassurance for me was that i always had a a woody doll woody doll in the hospital and that's a huge part of my emotional attachment to this world and these characters that they, they were there for me when nothing else was. So that's kind of part of, that's where my attachment comes from. And, and when, the, the reason why I, I take the, I hold the writers responsible because the writers are the ones that, well, it's, it sounds obvious, but like they're the ones that wrote the script. So that's where, that's where I direct my, my contempt towards. Because when it comes to the animation and everything, they all did a great job. And I'm sure the tech team worked tireless, probably underpaid, overworked hours to breathe life and detail into every frame of the film. So I, I hold no ill will against any of them for anything they did. I, I, I only take issue with the writers when it comes to the choices they made as storytellers. And like I said, I'm sure Josh Cooley's a wonderful person. I'm sure if we just went out to, to get a coffee somewhere, I'm sure it'd be a pleasant chat. I just take really personal offense to the decisions that he made when it comes to, comes to writing these characters. I, I guess it is just a sense of the characters that you knew feeling betrayed in some way. Yeah, I, I like, actually just, I, I have very similar feelings about characters and art that you do. Like, um, when I watch, watch The Gift, I'm, I'm partially, not like I idolize the characters in cachet, but I found them complex and endearing and flawed and, and, uh, interesting but the gift turned the the husband into just a shit goblin and the wife into a empty nice shell like the wife in cachet like has a an interesting art she has flaws even though like the story isn't really focused on her it's like it's really complicated and, and i feel just intense emotional like betrayal at at these at these characters being it's it's like they they feel like it was a sequel and they got flanderized they, it, like there there's a lot of buzz pushing his button to to figure out what to do moments in the gift but i feel like 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 it, it leads to to better 
more empathetic analysis if if I am also able to step back and depersonify the art almost like speak to it on like a sort of a, a materialist lens i'm working on a video it's like my first thing bad video in a while i'm talking about this weird film slash visual album slash movie musical uh, by melanie martinez called k12 one of the worst films ever made and i do get a like a little mean in this video but i ultimately i don't want i i don't want to to accidentally imply that it is a moral wrong to make a bad piece of of, of art like i i feel like that's a a kind of poison insinuation to leave in people's mouths i think it makes people like less likely to hear me out if i make them feel guilty for liking parts of it i think it makes the the analysis less useful to people who might want to write music because like my my video is mostly about songwriting because k12 is such a it's more of a visual album than a film that's sort of what, like where i where i lose you even though like i i relate so viscerally to to like the heart anger that that you feel when your kins are are messed up you then extrapolate that and and give and and give this this impression even even if it's not even something you really believe but you leave the insinuation that this film like violated your consent that it betrayed you that it uh is a an old friend who got bad but but i i again i i empathize very strongly i guess technically speaking that is how it's framed and that it's it's a series that that i'd grown up with and that meant the world to me that i saw just being torn down in basically every aspect and i wanted to communicate that through the series and i guess what i would say about that is that there's a lot of comments in part five of my of that series sharing their stories of how much toy story meant to them and how they felt the same way that i did in terms of feeling like everything they cared about and everything they were invested in was all thrown in the trash haha <laughs> forky for whatever reason it may have been and i guess that's kind of that's sort of what the series is... For. I mean, well, it, the series serves a couple different purposes. If you have no attachment to Toy Story whatsoever, I, I think that the plot analysis in terms of breaking down how all the different individual inconsistencies stack up, I think that can appeal to anybody whether you know the movie or not. But for those who have seen it and they did know Toy Story, I think it speaks to them on a maybe... It sounds pretentious, but maybe a deeper level in that they, they feel the same emotions that I felt or at least similar enough yeah. to where... that. It, I I really ex I do not want to stop you from like feeling these emotions or even expressing them. I think there also needs to be a moment where you sober up. Like I think there needs to be a a, a, a reflection. Like I I actually think it's commendable that you that you feel so strongly about about anything. I I think it's actually very cruel and dismissive when you when you get comments that seem like like irritated that you would care so much about about something i i think that's a like 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 they're high school bullies or something but i i also believe that there is a there there's a second layer to this discussion where you pull back in a sense and and reflect more broadly more materialistically on 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 the thing I, I i'm not trying to like lecture you or anything i'm trying to like come at this from a from an empathetic point of view uh, oh, I, I, I don't. I, I take no offense to anything you said. I, I think this has been a very healthy, productive conversation so far. Yeah, I, I do. Like, I wanted to like humanize you a little in my head, and I think that that's that's definitely happened. I feel, I, I feel like at least a little bit more acquainted with with your actual, uh, your your actual self. And I, and I'm glad that there is like a lot that we do agree on. Um, I, I would like to offer even. I'd like to throw you a bone in in all three videos of yours that I've seen. The the Toy Story 4 series, the Incredibles 2 series, and the the one-off little light year preview video. You make this concession where you, you're like, but it, it also looks gorgeous. Of course it does. It's a modern Pixar movie. But you know what? When you showed like clips of the original Incredibles and then showed clips from the new one, like maybe the new one has more fidelity, but the first one is so solidly like directed and every shot is so strikingly framed and like comic booky almost. And the second one does not have that that same that same like level level of consistent directing. Like it, it has a higher fidelity. There's nothing like that part where where Mr. Incredible is running towards the train at the beginning. That and he's like backlit by the train's headlights. That's just, just incredible like it's it's an excellently directed movie the the characters look like like they were drawn and then just br brought to life brought into the third dimension seamlessly and i think like it has a lot of qualities visually that the second one does not have and i and i also i think uh the the original toy story has quite a lot of visual qualities that toy story 4 does not have like toy story 4 has big wow moments like when they they go up the top of the carousel and you see like the the trailer shot yeah the trailer shot but 
there there is nothing in that movie that is nearly as impactful as like Buzz standing up on the on the stairway looking out the window and you're like right. there, there's not there's nothing at that level of just immediate and, and that's why like a, a comment you made that really that really bugged me that where where you briefly insinuated that turning red was the exception like that was one of the new ones that does not have the same level of visual fidelity when it is so clearly the most uh visually interesting like feasts for the eyes that that pixar has ever put out like it's i was so it was so refreshing to me like after so many movies of hyper realistic environments and like filled with blob people that now we we get this this more cartoonish more stylized more like like i was talking about how i wanted light year to be more of a 90s throwback turning red is a 2002 fro- throwback and it's just so uh invigorating it's it's exciting well i if i can just jump in real quick to clarify uh when i uh, talk about that in the videos i'm strictly referring to the visual fidelity in terms of like comparing frozone's ice effects in the first one to the second one that's more so what i'm gunning for when i talk about that element of it Did that and, and about turning red even there's, a, there's something that I'm currently in the process of editing, and one of the things that I say in that is that, like, I think right at the beginning, is that I actually have a lot of respect for the art style and the sort of that general, the, the style they're going for with how everything is presented to you. I, d- I just think texture-wise, it could have used some polish, but that that's that's where the distinction is. The the art style and the fidelity of it and and how it's, how it's presented in terms of cinematography and direction and the style they're trying to capture versus how it actually looks at in the end result in terms of its refinement and polish on, on the actual textures. That's more so where I draw that line. So I, I agree with you 100% right. about Turning Red's style. It's more so the fidelity that I take somewhat of an issue with. Like, all, all my cards on the ta- table, uh, Turning Red is my favorite Pixar movie. Well, obviously, like, one, I'm a furry. Uh, <laughs> and I and I, I I I too have a carnal desire to be an enormous fluffy animal, and I like that so much of the movie is focused on just the sensory experience of being an animal and how this is seen as like just expressly desirable by the plot. It's just assumed to be like cool. She self soothes with hairbrushes, and like I do that. I I it's it's got my favorite take on like mommy issues that <laughs> that disney or pixar has, has done i like how it isn't just like maylin as a character she has this this haughty cringy like uh braggadocious energy but that i i feel like it is both like fun to watch because i like kid characters that act like kids but also it serves as as like that confidence is later challenged as she is as she realizes how much of her personality is in service of her mother and uh she turns into a red panda that's that's another pretty big blow to her confidence i like i I like i like the idea of this of explaining the state that this kid is in that she's that she thinks she's completely in control of her life and identity but has a rude awakening and they explain this by having her like be just incredibly cringy i love that i love that so much um the climax feels like something i would have imagined in my head when i was seven <laughs> like like the the musical climax when, when like when the 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 dual motifs of the soundtrack finally like collide in the most s- stupid epic incredible way possible it it i've never cried harder at a movie probably i i I found the conclusion very sweet and simple and nice and again thematically quite coherent like throughout the whole movie like uh, the panda represents mei lin's like freedom of expression that she is now like growing up becoming a, a woman taking on this this new identity this new part of herself but then like they throw the wrench where the where the mom's panda represents her anger and her lashing out. So like there there's a bit of a, a conflict there. How like we want Mei Lin to have her panda, but the mom's panda is is destructive and monstrous. And they resolve this by having the mom keep her panda in a little in a little like Tamadachi pet. So it's like it becomes a thing that she must uh care for and and manage. That also represents her like growing closer to her daughter's interests, being this like piece of two thousand two youth culture it's a it's a beautiful tight little screenplay i least favorite pixar movie it's hard i used to say it was coco oh wow um uh that i was not sorry you called me after i was not ready to hear that (laughs) oh i'm so sorry (laughs) i i i 
I dislike Coco for a lot of very personal reasons. I think it comes down like weirdly harshly on Miguel for wanting to escape his abusive family uh and and have like a an escapist fantasy where his his dad is actually a rock star um and he like he ends up having like it makes this compromise where he must accept help from the the family's bigger better alabrije i am existentially horrified by the concept of an afterlife that is horrifically stratified and <laughs> like and vertical and has border patrol guards they put border patrol guards into a mexican heaven i <laughs> i every attempt to like humanize the family and their stupid like superstition and like resentment of music feels like a slap in the face and I, like Encanto had the opposite problem Encanto com came down weirdly harshly on Abuela like she actually has to say like uh yes I was a bitch I was a bitch to my entire family even like I think her motivations are a lot more understandable and also the movie is kind of wishy-washy on actually showing her negative effects on the family we're just kind of like insisted about it through song the turning red got it just right I I was I I was gonna say like Coco, because I have such a, a, a negative personal reaction to it. Uh, but then I saw L Lightyear, <laughs> and, and Lightyear is so incoherent. Like, maybe it's not as personally offensive and, like, existentially threatening as Coco, but it is also, like, just incompetent. I also, like, I don't like Finding Dory, although I haven't seen it in a while. I just remember, like, the, I, I, I remember that the disabled characters find plot-convenient ways to overcome their disability, which I found kind of like unsatisfying i i don't okay here's another hot take i don't really like soul either <laughs> and it has individual scenes that i really like so i can't call it the, the worst one i like i like when he gets to have a heart to heart with his mom and his buddies and he gets to to work through his personal issues in in his relationships i hate that this is now the umpteenth time that pixar has introduced a uh magical spiritual element to their story and then bogged it down with stupid boring office humor that like that part where the where where he dies and the movie just stops so they can explain this like bureaucratic uh, process by which souls are granted to the to the physical world i think the the themes are overstated and unearned by the script i uh, like it has that that same moment as in kanto where they just say what the theme of the movie was supposed to be the entire time i was not at all surprised or so i was not at all expecting to hear coco was the least favorite one that is yeah it, it catches a lot of people off guard actually <laughs> to, to give you an idea that's what what i would so what I will say is that inversely, for very personal reasons, I would rank it among my favorites in terms of the fact that, and I don't want to put it down on the conversation, I'll, I'll keep this brief, I promise. 2017, which is the year it came out, was the year I lost my grandfather to cancer, so it was very cathartic almost to watch that movie. But I, I would even, even if I just disregard that entirely, I, I would defend it on its own merits, even just as a self-contained story, but I, of course I don't want to get bogged down by any of that is there a yeah and also it has been a while since i've seen it the one that i have freshest opinions about is light year yeah light year is um, uh, I... light light year is bewilderingly terrible well uh, here's a question i'm just another one i'm just curious about how do you feel about cars 2 because cars 2 prior to light year was the one like that was the punching bag of I, pixar's catalog i i can't hate it too much it's so dumb i love that they just made it a spy movie but we're also just so like clearly very frustrated with the characters not having arms. So like the entire movie is based on them coincidentally having like being angled right to do the thing that they want to do. I will throw my weight behind Cars 1 and 3. I think Cars 1 is actually uh, among their, their better offerings. I, I like it a lot. And I like, I, I think Cars 3 feels like it's the actual Cars 2. I think you and I basically align 100% on our feelings about Cars because Cars 2 you would never hear me defend it as some masterpiece of storytelling because it's just so obviously stupid in every respect. But that's why I love watching it because of how hilariously insane it is. Cars 1, a lot of people dunk on Cars 1 a lot for being slow paced or whatever. And I, I agree that it's definitely, there's some stuff you could cut for pacing purposes. But I, I think what works about it really, the, the elements of it that are great work really well. Like the scene at the wheel well with Sally and McQueen looking over Radiator Springs and that James... Is it James Taylor, the Our Town song? I think that's... I I, I think that there is thematic 
uh, resonance to them being cars. Like there's a people make fun of the world building a lot. Like, but it's 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 about the politics of roads. It is about the 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 changing of the veins of a country. It's <laughs> yeah. It's and racing at least. Well, car cars too. You can say it for because that's like. Well, let's make a spy movie about cars and then figure out ways for cars to work ab- into the story. But Cars one and three, everything that happens in those in those movies has the the basis of of automobiles at the center of the of the conflict. So, yeah, I, I would I would also defend that there's there there are reasons why they that the characters themselves are cars. I I do love that there are things in Cars two that seem there specifically to like tease at the edges. Like they they just put a car pope in there. Which means that there had to be a car Christ. I love that stuff. I I also I also love that they that they brought Sporky to life. I I I I I defend that decision. I think they didn't do nearly enough with it. I like when worlds tease at the edges of their own of their own rules and kind of like introduce strange little edge cases. Because I do not think that Toy Story one through three. I I don't think that they were meticulously putting together the rules for which objects come to life and which don't. I think, I, I do not think that, that the Toy Story franchise has a very coherent mag- magic system. I, I don't think that they put a lot of thought into it either, but what I will say is that they did, generally speaking, keep it fairly simplistic. The fork is the first major part where I would think, alright, we're starting to push it a little bit. But um, I, I do like, I, I get like a little thrill out of out of the of the writer intentionally like straining their world a little bit like my favorite game is a uh furry visual novel called echo furry world building necessarily doesn't really make sense echo like takes place in the in the united states and there are characters that aren't white like the characters have a race even though they're all animals and also because it's 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 a it's a gay furry game and and it's partially about uh romantic situations they also have to make the concession of everyone in this guy's like friend group also being gay and and they play with that a little bit like they introduce like more characters and it turns out like oh they're gay too like things that you think are going to be about something else is actually like any notion of like homophobia is is like turns out to be a red herring as the like the game just really isn't about that and it turns out like like the entire population of this desert ghost town is like uh, apparently gay men and and then like they play with that e- like a little more in in Flynn's route where they introduce a like a, a packed gay sex den at the outskirts of this desert ghost town. So like 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 they're they're having fun with it. They're they're like taking assumptions that were presupposed that this 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 is a furry game. Everyone's an animal and also everyone's gay. These presuppositions that were gonna be there anyways, but actually like following through on it and and kind of poking at it with a stick in a way that I find like really fun and delightful. Uh, and I think like Sporky is kind of like when they introduce the gay sex den in Echo. <laughs> for as strange of a parallel as it may appear to be on the surface yeah uh i guess all i would say on that is that i i take issue because him being alive raises questions about the rest of the, like uh, w- what else could come to life how did he come to life and th- through what means would that allow sentience to be given to something else and maybe that's something that you like, because like you said, you, you like it when they kind of strain the rules of, of the edges of the rules of their world building. But that that just r- raises a lot of questions that I'm not particularly comfortable with just because of what it could mean for other non-sentient objects that could secretly be alive. All they need is googly eyes or a name or whatever, but Spe- I guess... It's, it's specifically this kind of magic system that's based on a presupposition like toy story was built on the idea that it would be cute and compelling for toys to come to life it, they, they didn't arrive at that through some anal intense magic system they started there they that that was presupposed that was i think like a, a an interesting question to ask maybe not even to give a good answer but to ask it to raise it to like to to playfully tease at it is to ask what counts as a toy <laughs> Well, what I would say is that if you're going to raise that question, you should probably be prepared to give an answer, because otherwise you're left in this kind of murky middle ground where it it just, it calls into question a lot of other things that have been established, like um, the, really any inanimate object they've ever encountered that could hypothetically be alive. Are, are all sporks alive? In which case, what a horrible existence for the sporks that are used every day in kids' lunches. 
and just I kind of don't want to go in there because there's a lot. There's yeah. there's a there's a whole can of worms. To I, open it. I I simply I am I personally am content with he's a toy. He became a toy when he was made, and now he's alive because that's that's simply one of the presuppositions that the that the movie presents us with. It's not a rigorous magic system. Um, and I, I, I imagine that is enough for most people because a lot of people really love Forky, but I, I just, it, it's, for, for, I mean, for I don't me, like the character. I think he's annoying and oh, like, a, a, a he's, he's just a, uh, he's the MacGuffin. Oh, <laughs> do you, I guess if we can move on to his, his character, do you love how they speed run his character arc and then turn him into a plot device? Yeah, it's, it's so dumb. I, I mean, like I said, I, I don't love it. I said, yeah. Right, no, but I'm sorry. I, 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 not... I, I, too, I too was being sarcastic. Right, yeah, I, I did not actually mean to imply that you loved it or anything. I just, it's, it, it's merely <laughs> they, calling out the stupid writing device that is. It's, it's, it's like, like, I, I do, I do like, I, I think it is funny when, when writers tease apart their worlds a little, but they don't do anything with it. Like, they, they don't care about the can, can of worms that they've opened. To, to go back to Echo, the reason I think that Echo is so, is so much of a better story is that they actually follow through on, like, the aesthetic product of this, like, haunted ghost town also being this, like, hyper-masculine, <laughs> like, <laughs> um sort of conglomeration of 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 sex and secrets it's it's like it's it's kind of creepy that they're like like the the gay sex den is such a a, a foreboding location the the writer actually took uh inspiration from irreversible which i think is is hilarious so i i think there is more to it than simply poking there there's more to it than than just making a joke about it and moving on and having him be a plot device uh but I do think the best scene of, of the movie is when the knife asks, why are we alive? And he just says, I don't know. I, I, I love that. I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that that you shouldn't raise it. Because, like you said, they didn't arrive at that conclusion of, like, Toy, toy Story exists because they wanted to tell a, to tell a story about talking toys and communicate a message through that. Not because they wanted to set up an in-depth system of what it means to be a toy. But as an, what I would say in addition to that is that they simultaneously knew not to push the limits of it it's like they they knew they knew what what where what the, the box they set for themselves and they were more focusing more so on the characters and the stories you can tell and they didn't really try to introduce anything that could bend the rules of what it meant to be a toy but then they do in toy story 4 and they don't really make it a, a focus of the conversation it's just sort of something that's used to set up the main thrust of the story if you will and that's where my issue comes in that they don't do anything with it and i it's that totally fine sense. if you, if you uh, just find it fun that they are poking at the rules of their world. Yeah, and I I, I can I can get to, get into like a really well defined and rigorous magic system. Like I love I ju I just this is another huge tangent, but I just finished rereading Zatch Bell, which is a, a manga that I really loved uh, when I was young. And that not only does everyone have their own powers, they have their own like updating um like stack of of spells and attacks. And the and the manga it like wastes time almost to explain why certain spells wouldn't work in this situation that you might be thinking about like one of the one of the characters has a, a shield that that envelops like a, an entire sphere a, a sphere around them and every time every time you might be thinking well why doesn't she just use the 360 shield there is something there to explain like why it wouldn't work it's like it's i, I can see the appeal of like a really well-oiled uh magic system but i also i don't think um that's that's one of the main draws of of toy story in, in particular or or cars or any of these any of these kids movies that are starting from the position that it that it would be that for a story about roads everyone should be a car or for a story about emotional development and maturity the characters should be feelings like uh it, there's like an intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation behind world building and and magic systems sometimes i don't want to sorry i this 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 went on a, a really long time I, I my voice is starting to go i was just gonna say um I don't want to keep you any longer than than you have to. Of course, is there anything else major that you wanted to discuss with me before we wrap things up? I would like to cautiously offer the idea 
of not talking about the movie chronologically every time. <laughs> um, the, 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 the thing about the Toy Story 4 review is that since so much of the movie is, is um, strange, odd editing decisions, that ends up taking up a lot of time in your video as well. Things that, like, that ultimately don't relate to the emotional core of what you're trying to, trying to communicate. I, I feel like, like, like rhetorically, it would be far stronger if you were able to perhaps build up an intensity. You start with the with the small but valid criticisms and then you build up to characters and and plot structure motivation i <laughs> well so uh that's kind of what i tried to do with my light year review i started with just well let's talk about the movie's existence and how this kind of is a contradiction of a movie to exist and then i go into some of the, the the music stuff i talk about the plot and then i go through the characters building up to my biggest issues with the movie that being how buzz is portrayed and of course the stupidity that is that plot twist. Uh, yeah. The reason why I ultimately, well, I was probably going to go back to it anyway, but I got I got a lot of comments on that saying that they couldn't really follow along with the structure of the movie because usually I do give that play by play of this is how it all unfolds, but not, uh, everyone wasn't able to fully grasp what I was saying just because they didn't they don't have that that structured breakdown to to support. And I guess in case you're just curious as to why I use that structure in the way that I do. I just, for as vain as it may sound, I just like it. I, I find it kind of fun to, 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 it's... Oh, it's not vain. It's, 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 you're expressing your preference. I, I kind of, I look at it as, as an adventure that I'm taking the audience through. This wild, wacky journey from start to finish. And then once we reach the end and we've seen how everything unfolds in the story, we can take a step back and look at how all the pieces connect together as an overarching whole. And I acknowledge, of course, that's not for everybody, because some people will, will just get tired of hearing me talk about the story play uh, point by point forever. And what I will say is that I have made an effort moving forward to maybe not include some of the really minor things in the plot. Uh, you, you, you could include them if you did them really quickly at the beginning. Like, that's, that's the thing. Like, it, it's not like you shouldn't talk about small things movies are, are entirely made out of small things i i don't think and, and it can be fun it can be fun to say like why why are why it, do they even have the sugar bombs on the table why is it there why <laughs> yeah it's, it's such a it's such a weird choice to make uh um, and this is there's plenty of stuff like that that's kind of why in my incredibles 2 series i i kind of because some comments I got on, on Toy Story 4 were saying like why do you care so much about a driveway being there or other ancillary minor details so I kind of started a signpost. Don't worry, I'm not saying this is a big deal. I'm just, I'm, I'm drawing this, I'm drawing attention to this because it annoys me, and I want to share that. But I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to get the misconception that I'm citing this as like, oh, this movie is terrible because they yeah. changed the order of, uh, dial options in the Incredible and Incredibles two. And furthermore, I think you could get away with saying that once. We're gonna get to, like go through all the stuff that annoyed me personally, and then get it all out of the way right at the beginning. Like, so you wouldn't have to keep saying that every time you want to talk about something minor. Although, like, okay, one more kind of weird thing that I want to clarify: you you have this 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 um this is the last thing I promise, but there is a a running theme of your like the way you judge the importance of these nitpicks where if the plot inconsistency is like suitably argued to be in service of the plot then it becomes more important like it's more important to point out that the trash can is full on the first day of school because it is what allows woody to find all of these things that that Bonnie then as assembles into Sporky. Like, the nitpick ascends, because if it wasn't there, then the simulation would play out differently or something. It's, it's, it's something that I'm having trouble wrapping my head around. Well, I guess I can give you some insight as to what my thought process is there. I think I, I, drew, the, I drew attention to this example in my Incredibles 2 series, but I'll just give a refresher for anyone in the audience who may not have seen that. The, the thing I mentioned about the Incredible and the, the location of the the th uh, things that the Incredible can do has changed locations on that dial. And where I draw the line in terms of where I take it, major issue with those things is that, let's say hypothetically we rearrange where all those, wh where those mechanics are, func where those functions are, that's the word, where the functions of the Incredible dial are to how they were originally laid out in the first movie. Nothing really changes because the hover mode is still there, or the Hydra mode, rather. Now... If it were the case that there wasn't a Hydra mode in the first movie, and then there was in the second movie, 
even though we're supposed to believe that the Incredible was just abandoned and forgotten somewhere between movies, that would be a bit more significant to me because the Hydra mode is what allows them to reach the reach the Hydra foil. But it's more of I guess visual visual inconsistencies or things that if they change wouldn't actually impact how the story plays out are things that I would still call attention to. Like for instance, Tony's redesign. Obviously, Tony looks nothing like he did in the first movie. I, I wanted to call attention to that, but if if he looked the same as he did, nothing about the movie would change. So that's that's what I would say is that it's valid to call those things out as an inconsistency and maybe talk about why well, these things... I, I think a lot about the movie would change because one of the characters would have a different face. That's that's And whereas I think if the trash can was not full on the first day of kindergarten, the story would still like play out the same way because they would probably write a different reason for 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 bonnie to be able to assemble these materials or sporky would be some other craft item well i guess at that point we're talking about how they would rewrite the movie but i'm more appealing to let's assume there are no writers and that this is all happening let's let's assume we jump into the simulation this is just our life if it's the case that tony changes his appearance we might go huh that's weird i could have sworn you looked real different three seconds ago Whereas if the trash can doesn't have everything filled up and there is no spork that they can use, then Forky doesn't get made. And since he's the main MacGuffin that allows all the events of the story to unfold, I think that's a pretty important thing to call attention to. All right. Um, I, I think that speaks to another difference in how you and I view film. Because I, I'm, I'm never seeing it as a simulation that we're, or, or like a window to another reality that we are perceived. Like I'm thinking of this as a, as a series of images conveying a narrative or an aesthetic experience. And like the, the trash can being full is so visually inconsequential. And I think that's in, in fact far less worthy of complaining about than even something like tony's face changing because tony's face represents so much of the film he take he, he's he's a it's the design of a character it's um you're looking at him the whole time and, and that's like how it is in this piece of art that i'm watching and being affected by tony's face changing is about as important to me in terms of the story as it would be if he just had a different shirt on like that nothing there there are no plot points that are that are dependent on tony looking a certain way i guess is what i would say I... and as for looking into a different reality that's this is this is a another fictional world that i'm jumping into to experience what's going on with these guys temporarily okay any any breaks in a uh any breaks in the continuity or any anything that doesn't seem like it could have logically happened is a major thing that can pull me out of the movie um, if that helps. I don't know if that helps at all in terms of can I, understanding. Can I, put, can I plug one of my videos? <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, I, I'm assuming I, you're okay with it. I'm just going to yes. plug your channel in the description after this. Yes, please. This. Um, I have a, it's kind of old. I, I, I don't explain myself perfectly, but it's a video that I think explains something that's, I, I think it's, is very uh, relevant to the, the sort of language barrier that we have in this, in this specific area. Um, it's my video about funny games. Uh, it's called Funny Games Unveiling Fiction, uh, and it's it's, it's a, a a video about my favorite piece of like meta horror content, specifically the American remake, which I actually think is better. the The director remade his own film. This is the same guy who directed Caché, which is just my favorite film. Period. I think like watching that will help you understand where I'm coming from when I am confused by you saying that the that the the trash can being full is a greater malady than the, a, a character having an entirely different face i will because i still haven't watched the other one you sent me uh oh, when we first fine. got in contact but i i, I did i did pl plan to i promise i just things got a little hectic but right. i do i do want to check it out because it, it does it, do, it does intrigue me i i am i am to an analysis person i I like uh I like being anal about about media. I I like being snobbish and pretentious about it as well. I enjoyed this call very much. Yeah. It's exact it's it's exactly what I hoped for. Yeah, I'm very this has been a lot I was a little apprehensive about it just because this is the first time I've ever, I'm really actually branching out to chat with another YouTuber, but this is this was fun. This was I think it was productive, healthy, civil, and I'm very happy I decided to jump on to chat with you today. This is great. Yeah, I'm very I'm very happy I reached out instead of like 
continuing to view you as a spectacle <laughs> out, outside of my uh, field of influence. Um, I'm happy I, I managed to sort of gain a, a little bit more of a kinship. The thing with the with the Toy Story 4 review, even if like I even if I, I wasn't really on board with most of it, you still there, there there's still a, a through line to it. I I I felt it's very sincere, <laughs> very and, and you also made like a good point once every five minutes, which is a good good rate. <laughs> hey, I mean that's honestly to hear that someone who doesn't particularly agree t uh to a d to a significant extent with my perspective on Toy Story four still came away thinking that there was a substantive through line to the series, that's that's good to hear, because well, another thing I'll always say is that you don't... No one ever has to always agree with what I say 100% of the time. I think it, it's it's almost weird to think that someone would actually watch any of my videos and 100% agree with everything I bring up. I, I like to think that I'm able to present an entertaining, thought-provoking discussion of a movie, even if you end up coming away disagreeing with my ultimate conclusion. Yeah, uh, the, and you are improving. The Incredibles 2 video was better. Uh, oh, I, I, so I, I believe wholeheartedly that Incredibles, my Incredibles 2 series is a step up in terms of my Toy Story 4 series in just about every way imaginable. It's, it's, it's more been, persuasive, I think. <laughs> uh, would, would you think, would, if I may ask, does that have anything to do with the fact that I'm less heated and less aggressive for most of it? Uh... I don't want to fall on the side of like shaming you for experiencing these intense emotions, but uh, I I do I do believe that it was more rhetorically effective because you were uh more level headed about it. But 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 you still you still let it out sometimes. Like I liked when you were just like, "Who are you?" <laughs> at at Bob. The last thing I'll say on that note is that I get some comments asking, "Are you really this mad about the driveway?" And it's like, well. No. I mean, when I, I... I always hesitate to say this because it always risk com runs the risk of coming off as, like, you're just putting... You're putting on a show for an audience you don't believe what you're saying, but when I watched Toy Story 4 for the first time and I saw that the driveway had been... had been... had materialized out of thin air, I thought to myself, that... you didn't... that... huh. I... I guess they made that change. That's weird. That was not how it used to be. Whereas in my video, I'm like, wait, there's a driveway there? Why is there a driveway there? That's not an easy thing to do. Like, my voice is dead at the end of it. I, I need a gallon of water and a nice night off, maybe maybe, maybe a little bit of a snack with some honey on it to recover after blowing my, my diaphragm out like that. Um, well, take care of yourself. Um, oh, yeah. Abs well, I, what I will say is that I mentioned earlier I pulled, like, I think I said 15 hour, it was more than like 18 hour work nights to get Incredibles 2 done, because I promised people I would get it done by the end of September, and there were some rumblings on my Discord server like, mm, I hope he can live up his end of the bargain, it's almost the end of September, so I, I acknowledge that I have some workaholic problems in terms of, I, I, I value the, I value a commitment to a schedule for a video release, and I try to put some level of quality assessment on myself to make sure I get it done to a certain degree by a certain point, even at the cost of my own health, which is not always a great thing, but I, I'm working to improve. I've, I've cut back significantly since Incredibles 2 to kind of balance my life, my work life balance out a lot more. Yeah, but to, there, there's a movie about this. You might have seen it. It's called Lightyear. I was I was I was waiting <laughs> if you were gonna make that joke. It's like yeah, I I think that might speak to me on a deeper level. I'll have to check it out sometime. But to uh, to kind of put a, a closer on the the Toy Story 4 yelling thing. A every, I mean, you can hear at the end of part five that my my tears are genuine. That's that. There's no show being put on there. But part of the entertainment, at least I thought at the time, was this being this loud, energetic person who got who flipped it over the slightest of things. And from what I've read and heard, a lot of people did find entertainment in that. However, and I think it's for that reason that a lot of some people will still say that my Toy Story Four series is better. But I strongly believe now that. Now that I look back on my Toy Story 4, I, I will still stand by the actual points I made for the most part. Maybe a couple things I would have reworded, but the the presentation of it, I think, is much, much more effective in Incredibles 2 when I, I choose the moments to lose it. Like, I... If you look at if you look at it as one overarching series rather than three individual videos, there is a ramping up of intensity, because when I get to the climax, it's all bets are off. I'm fl We're flying off the walls. 
it's totally a bonkers and my yeah, the intensity it's, it's, of my emotional reaction is kind of trying to mirror the same off the wall stakes that's happening in the climax so it's, I like, think it's that's, like a, it's like a song you gotta you have to understand like the way the piece breathes the the way the 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 intensity ebbs and flows i and and that's why like i think like the the toy story 4 video is so much harder to get through because you're just on all the time <laughs> yeah um and I can fully empathize with that 100%. And that's something that I've worked to to correct moving forward in terms of when I when I choose to let out that let out the tiger that yells at things, especially because it's just it's already exhausting enough to do because a two hour video takes about four hours to record because there's just endless retakes and saying lines a better way and things like that to then add on a level of just ferocious intensity in, in my voice. It, it's even just doing that little bit I just did for you where I yelled about the driveway was already like, oh, my throat's, let's not do that again. <laughs> so, yeah, that's on, on a technical perspective, there's a lot about Toy Story 4 that I would change. And I think have I've started to change in Incredibles 2 and hope to further improve upon with my upcoming series. All right. This has been a blast. Thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you as well. This has been an absolute blast. If you want to check out their content... I believe, is it fair to say you do more music stuff than video essay type things? I, I am more of a musician than a video essayist. I, I do like one album every two months, but uh, videos are more like two a year. But I, I do like my video content and a lot of people seem to get a lot out of it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to checking out your stuff now that we've had this chat. I'm very much interested in seeing what you have to say on a lot of stuff, so... They have my recommendation. Their stuff will be linked in the description below. And uh, anything else you have to say? Uh, no, I think I, I also had a very lovely time. Uh, I, I, I think you're a very pleasant person to talk with. I would say that as well about you. Thank you. Um, I need to have some more water. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I'm going to go down a bottle of water after this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good night, everybody. And I guess it's time for me to do the classic. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for next time. I hope to see you all soon for whatever you decide to watch next. Goodbye. Goodbye.